Hello, everyone, and welcome to the newest episode of Real History. I am your host, history professor Jared Frederick, and I thank you for joining me for this third installment as we break down the 2003 Civil War film, Gods and Generals. As some of you have mentioned in the comments, at times it seems like this movie is as long as the Civil War itself, and for that reason, we have been doing this in three parts. And so, here we are with the conclusion, and this segment that we will be taking a look at examines the year 1863. As a brief recap from where we left off last time, in episode two, we by and large spent that time looking at the Battle of Fredericksburg, which takes place in December of 1862 and a monumental defeat for United States forces. And we are going to be picking up on this episode and taking a look at the Union Army's time in Falmouth, Virginia. And for all intents and purposes, this was known as the Valley Forge of the Army of the Potomac. This is their time out in the wilderness, so to speak, as they are trying to rebuild and recuperate after a series of staggering losses. And unfortunately, they're going to be heading into the meat grinder once again. And so with that, we're going to pick up right now with the Chamberlain brothers as we continue our look at Gods and Generals. I mean, that is this army here in Stoneman Switch. Sure, I'm kicking up a fuss about Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation. Oh, it says here that enlistments are down and desertions are up. A number of important topics are mentioned right here off the bat. Uh, there are the discussions about desertions, and in both the Army of Northern Virginia and the Army of the Potomac, uh, there were always desertions that spiked during wintertime. Uh, wintertime for these armies is defined by monotony, hardship, disease, uh, even to a greater extent sometimes than during the other times of the year. The importance of newspapers is also highlighted in this scene. Newspapers were not only a means of information, but they were also an important toll in intelligence gathering, so said Robert E. Lee himself on a number of occasions. We also hear about the release of the Emancipation Proclamation, which of course took first on January 1st, 1863. And this is, in its time, a highly controversial document. It is a presidential proclamation that is delivered as a war measure. So Abraham Lincoln can cripple the Confederacy by depriving them of their number one means of production, and that is the slave labor that drives their economy and their war machine. There are some who even today claim that the Emancipation Proclamation was a rather toothless document, that there was not much of an edge to it, that it perhaps wasn't so daring after all, uh, but I would argue to the contrary. It does free slaves who have already fled to the military lines of the United States. It prohibits, or rather deters, foreign countries such as Great Britain and France who have economic interests in the Confederacy from joining on the cause of the South. And even more importantly, perhaps, it opens up the door for some 200,000 African Americans to enlist in the United States Army and the United States Navy. Therefore, I think it's very safe to say that that proclamation becomes foundational toward a more diverse military force, and it is also the bedrock of all civil rights legislation that will follow. Why shouldn't they? Freeing the slaves wasn't a war aim when this all began, but war changes things. It sorts things out. 
The line that we just heard is a very good reflection on Chamberlain's views in regard to slavery. And one of the best books about Joshua Chamberlain is by the historian Edward Longacre. And this is what Longacre has to say about Chamberlain at this transitional moment in the American Civil War. Despite his moderate views on slavery, Chamberlain would come to approve the president's course not only as an economic and diplomatic weapon, but as a vehicle for recruiting black men into the army. As a passionate defender of the Union, he increasingly believed in using any expedient, even one devised by a Republican president, against those who would dismantle the world's greatest experiment in democracy. We can gather from this that Chamberlain was very much representative of many citizens of the North at this time, that he came to embrace emancipation initially as a measure for waging and winning the war, and only later seeing it as a moral equation. Do me a favor. Don't call me Lawrence. And don't call Negroes darkies. That's a patronizing expression from which we must free ourselves. This bit of dialogue here is rather problematic. Uh, not because northern troops didn't hold racist views. Uh, by our standards today, most white Americans living in the country at this time would be considered racist by our standards today. Uh, the views that Tom Chamberlain expresses here would have been uh, nothing out of the norm in the eyes of many at the time. However, it all comes down to proportion when we think about the dialogue and the representations within this film. This is the only bit of racially inflammatory language that we hear in the entirety of this movie. Not a single Confederate character in this movie uses any racially derogatory language whatsoever. And most definitely these would have been words used in Confederate camps and headquarters in making reference to the black men and women who served as the Confederate labor force. And so the fact that it is a Union soldier saying the only one derogatory phrase in this movie. It is not representational at all, proportionately speaking. It is the systematic coercion of one group of men over another. It has been around since the book of Genesis. Of the many long and drawn out speeches to be found in this movie, I certainly think this one, Chamberlain's, uh, is the, the most uh, appealing and genuine among them. The problem, however, though, is the fact that the script of this film is sometime at odds with itself. Chamberlain is talking about emancipation. He's talking about these noble ideas of liberating the enslaved men and women of the South. However, within this same film, you have absolutely no representation of Confederates acknowledging that that is the very thing that they are fighting for. And so that leads us to believe as audience members that half of the characters in this movie are lying. <laughs> Which side is lying here? in their dialogue? I think I know the answer. But once more, it's worth revisiting the words of historian Edward Longacre in regard to Chamberlain's perceptions on slavery. And Longacre says this, his, Chamberlain's, views towards slavery appear less ambiguous in the light of his post-war pronouncements on the subject. A careful reading of those comments show that he championed emancipation principally as a military measure, a weapon in the arsenal of the Union, a tool to uproot secession's hold on the South. During the war, the only African Americans he championed were those who fought beside the white soldiers in the Army of the Potomac. In postbellum years, he came to view slavery as, quote, so repugnant to justice and freedom. Yet even later in life, when holding political office as a convert to republicanism, his views on civil rights for free blacks were not enlightened, and his unwillingness to advance the more liberal social agenda of his party often put him at odds with its leadership. This serves as an important lesson for us because even the more progressive of individuals in the Civil War era were still products of their time, 
They were still limited by the social conditions of the era. They may not have been as forward-thinking as we wish them to. And ultimately, as the old saying goes, time can be a harsh judge to all. As we can see this moment of transition from winter to spring in this shot, it's worth reflecting on just how difficult winter time was for these armies. Fredericksburg was in some ways an anomaly because winter time was typically a moment when vast campaigns were not unfolding. It was a time to rebuild, re-strengthen, resupply. And one thing that made this such a, a difficult season is because the roads would freeze and maneuverability was greatly hindered as a result. A, a very good book that looks at the year 1862, the first half of 1863 for the Army of Northern Virginia is this book right here, A Glorious Army, written by my friend, historian Jeffrey Wirt. And on this given moment, Wirt says, during the winter months, the heaviest burden of command on Lee centered on the chronic scarcity of supplies. He and his staff were constantly at alleviating the shortages of food for the troops and for the forage for the animals. Before the end of January 1863, the Army commander had confided to President Davis that the one of supplies, quote, causes me the greatest uneasiness. What the coming of spring ultimately allowed for was for more foraging parties to go out. It unclogged some of the supply lines and it offered the new potentials for a new season of campaigning. And sure enough, Robert E. Lee had huge ambitions as we move into the spring of 1863. Oh my, General, we do appreciate the gift. Where do you get all these lemons? We are once again introduced to the home of Moss Neck Manor in these scenes. This was a, a large antebellum classic style plantation that was built in 1856, just a few miles outside of Fredericksburg, Virginia. Uh, the Corbins, by 1860, owned somewhere around 40 slaves or so who managed the grounds, the home, and the properties. And this was a family among the Virginia elite, and it became a very natural habitat for some of the primary leaders of the Army of Northern Virginia. Stonewall Jackson himself insisted on not rooming in the mansion itself, he located his headquarters in a cabin that was located on the property. Uh, but despite that, he certainly became well acquainted with the Corbin family. Kind providence that provides kindness. <laughs> and Miss Corbin, the Yankees have not succeeded in cutting our rail lines to the south. And of course, you can't make a Stonewall Jackson movie without incorporating lemons. And according to Stonewall Jackson lore, this was a man who would cut up lemons with his pocket knife and uh, he would suck on them as he was uh, walking around the streets of Lexington and in Confederate camps. That may be a little bit exaggerated. Uh, it may be a story that is a bit embellished. Uh, to make him even more quirky and eccentric than what he already was. I know for a fact, though, that uh, Jackson's fruit of choice was peaches, <laughs> which we, I believe, actually see in the director's cut of this film. But the movie, theatrically, is long enough as it is, and we don't have time to get into the director's cut. <laughs> The little girl of Janie Corbin was a staple around Stonewall Jackson's Confederate headquarters and uh, according to various accounts from his staff officers, he grew quite close with her. And that was in part because Jackson was separated from his own family. Uh, he had a daughter that was born just a few months prior to all of this. He had yet to meet her. 
And as a result, in my mind, Janie Corbin becomes somewhat of a, of a surrogate daughter uh, to Jackson while he is here in uh, winter bivouac. Mrs. Corbin, thank you for your many kindnesses. Our cause and our country are in your debt. I only regret, General, that we could not do more. As I mentioned in our previous episode on Gods and Generals, Mossneck Manor is now a privately owned home, uh, and on very rare occasion in the last 20 years has it been open and made accessible to the public in any form. However, in 2004, 2005, I can't remember the exact year off the top of my head, I, in fact, had a chance to tour Mossneck Manor, and it was a fascinating place to visit. One of the other really interesting things, useless bit of trivia about Mossneck Manor, was one of its previous owners, a gentleman by the name of Theodore Hauser, uh, who was, I believe, the vice president of Sears and Roebuck. He purchased Mossneck Manor during the Great Depression and uh, revived it from obscurity. It had fallen into a dilapidated state. And, uh, so one of the leaders of Sears and Roebuck essentially saved this historic structure. Uh, the, what we see in the film, though, is not the actual place. She's not feeling very well today. All of the children have come down with the fever. Please come in. Indeed, a number of children living at Mossneck Manor had come down with scarlet fever, and this was one of the great fears of any parent in 1860s America. And this is one reason why life expectancy was so low in the middle of the 19th century. Life expectancy might have only been 45 or 50 uh, for civilian populations during the Civil War. And one reason why it was so low is because so many children died of illness before they reached age five or six. In the age of pre-antibiotics, it was a life and death struggle every year, especially for young people. <laughs> I For as overly sentimental as it may seem, uh, this was a moment that was in fact uh, documented by staff members who were part of Stonewall Jackson's headquarters. The irony of the moment here is perfectly underscored by Sandy Pendleton's character, that this was a man who seemed impervious, uh, even emotionally, to all of the death that constantly consumed him. But then when this five-year-old girl who he befriended uh, passes away, it, it, it really takes the wind out of his sails. The other really tragic thing uh, about all of this is that Janie Corbin's father, who was an enlisted man in the 9th Virginia Infantry, died six months later in combat outside of Culpeper, Virginia. And so I think it's a, all in all a good representation, uh, historically speaking, the fact that you have such a, a large number of Southerners who are losing so much losing children to natural causes, losing their men in battle. Uh, it was a, a very, very demanding time. This scene at what is supposed to be Guinea Station was actually filmed at the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad Museum located in Baltimore, Maryland. And one of the great tasks of the production designer was concealing all of the modern skyline and intrusions and preventing them from getting in any shots. And thus the construction of this station and the water tower that we see uh, very well concealed uh, a lot of that intrusion that would have taken audiences out of the scene. Uh, but this shot in particular was uh, crafted using a, a, a painting by artist Mort Kunstler as its basis. Oh. <laughs> 
this is not something that I envision Stonewall Jackson doing, engaging in such a public display of romantic affection with his wife. This was a very traditional, religious, private man, and I just don't see him <laughs> smooching his wife on the train platform here in front of hundreds of his own soldiers. I, I just don't see him doing that. Mr. Booth is in the city for the entire month. He's playing in Hamlet, Catherine Petruccio, The Merchant of Venice. And as I'm uh, sitting here watching portions of the director's cut, which I'm not really offering much commentary on, my God, there's just so much material and content and scenes in this movie. What were they thinking? Hooker's Move 5 Corps. Maybe 7,000 men. They're digging around Chancellor's Mansion. Sedgwick has another 40,000 spread out along the Stafford Heights. We now find ourselves in the wilderness, the setting for the May 1863 Battle of Chancellorsville, which took place right below Fredericksburg, Virginia, a few months after that dreadful winter campaign. And uh, what we don't get a sense of here uh, is that the battle has already initiated by the point that we, we see here. Uh, the the so-called cracker box meeting between Stonewall Jackson, Robert E. Lee, Jeb Stewart, and some of their subordinates. It's more than twice our strength. We do not yet understand his plan. He may still be planning a move toward Gordonsville, move around below us, cut us off from Richmond. I have a few things to mention in regard to this scene, uh, one of which is Robert Duvall's accent. Uh, we can uh, pick apart this movie for its uh, sometimes uh, wooden and unlively script, uh, but Robert Duvall used his father's accent as his uh, means of inspiration. Uh, Duvall's family. His ancestors originally hailed from Virginia. He claimed that he is related to Robert E. Lee through his mother's side. Oh man, I heard that. Uh, <laughs> I heard that from people hundreds of times when I worked at Gettysburg National Military Park. Lee must have had one of the largest families in human history because uh, every other person uh, from Virginia seemed to be related from him. In any case, he really gets down the voice of what perhaps Robert E. Lee sounded like. The Virginia Tidewater accent, it's quite pitch perfect here. So now the big question is, what is the Army of the Potomac, 73,000 strong, now commanded by General Joseph Hooker, seeking to do? What Hooker hopes to achieve is to swing around the Army of Northern Virginia's left flank with his vast legions, catch the enemy by surprise, set the terms of battle himself, which his predecessor Ambrose Burnside was unable to do at Fredericksburg, and hopefully squash the opposition once and for all. And as he very confidently declared heading into this match, may God have mercy on General Lee, for I shall have none. But General Lee has a trick up his sleeve, and it becomes apparent with some information that's going to be brought to him. Out here in the west along this town pack here, the right flank is in the air. It's the one place they're not digging in. Clearly, they're not expecting any pressure there. This dramatic arrival of Confederate General Jeb Stewart is described quite well in the book The Great Partnership by another associate of mine, Christian Keller. This is a, a very good study examining the dynamic uh, collaborative nature of Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson. And this is what Keller has to say on this moment. Then, out of nowhere, Jeb Stewart rode up, the jangling of his sword and spurs piercing the stillness of the scene like a thunderclap. Dismounting, he rode up to Lee and Jackson, barely able to contain himself. As if a prayer had been answered, he announced that Fitzhugh Lee had discovered the federal right hanging in the air. It was not tied down to any natural feature nor fortified at all. No cavalry guarded it either, 
as Hooker had sent nearly all his mounted arm away on Stoneman's raid well to the south. As in previous campaigns, Stewart had brought key intelligence at the key moment. This new reality electrified both the commanding general and his lieutenant. They looked incredulously at the cavalrymen, then at each other. Jackson, probably smiling, both at his friend's delight in sharing the news and at the prospects it uncovered. This was that miracle moment that Lee had been waiting for, and he was not going to squander it. We must outflank the flankers, General. We must beat them at their own game. Take your entire corps, General Jackson, and destroy the enemy. This nighttime conference of May 1st, 1863 has a very fabled place in the lost cause myth of the Confederacy. Because what it ends up being is the last meeting between Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson. And a number of decades later, James Powers Smith, one of Jackson's staff members, uh, returns to the site and he dedicates a granite marker uh, denoting the, the final location of the, the Lee Jackson bivouac. And so it, it, it's a very fabled moment in the lore of the Confederacy because it portended both victory and disaster almost simultaneously. Good. There we go, our heads. Dear Lord. Yeah, let's have another prayer. Why not? There's, there's not enough in the movie already. Yeah, we get it. Stonewall Jackson was religious. Get on with the movie. Get on with it. Yes, get on with it. Many of the brigades within the 11th Corps uh, to fight at Gettysburg two months later as well were largely comprised of German immigrants. And because of this, and this era of xenophobia, especially against Germans and Irishmen, these men were already marching under a cloud of sorts, a stigma. And as a result of their uh, forthcoming fleeing from the enemy in both this fight and in Pennsylvania in the weeks that followed, uh, there will be a further stigma, an unfair stigma, uh, that is attached to their reputation. It's not their fault that they were placed in the precarious positions that they were and that they were overrun uh, by these large Confederate forces. These were men thrown into very uncomfortable circumstances and did the best they could. It will not be until the 11th Corps transfers to the Western Theater of the War and ends up fighting under General William Tecumseh Sherman that they will finally have the opportunity to give as good as they got. This sequence has some inherent strengths and weaknesses. I think one thing that it well conveys is the scope of this assault as we see this large column of men emerging from the tree line, pressing forward. Uh, and there are firsthand accounts that were, well, it wasn't recreated in this scene, uh, but as such was this flood of men uh, coming through this thickly wooded area known as the wilderness, uh, that there were uh, deer and raccoons and rabbits and uh, everything like that that were running in front of them. It was this literal stampede of wildlife that was fleeing the Confederate advance. That wildlife runs into the camps of the Union Army's 11th Corps and the U.S. troops aren't thinking uh, in the long term here. They just see all this wildlife running through their camp and they start to grab their muskets and start to shoot at uh, all, the, all the deer <laughs> and critters that are running through, not realizing what is about to hit them.
Here's another prime example of how this movie just gets bogged down in the minutia. Is it really necessary to list off all of the brigades and all of the units that are coming out of the woodlot? It's a movie that gets so hyped up in its quest for authenticity that here, both literally and figuratively, uh, it can't see the forest through the trees. <laughs> I spoke to a reenactor who was in these scenes, and in fact, it was the same line of reenactors who were just being cycled through again and again and again as they were marching out of the tree line, and they would just shift positions ever so slowly. That's why you see some of the <laughs> same reenactors on three or four occasions in these advances moving forward. Uh, and so they had to come out of the trees and run up this hill six times in a row. <laughs> By the end of the day, I guess they were just completely winded uh, by the experience. Uh, and what are they paid for it? They're paid nothing. Uh, <laughs> these are all volunteer reenactors uh, with whom movies like this often wouldn't be possible. Upward of 3,000 reenactors served as extras in this movie. And I think one of the, the few really notable legacies about this film is the fact that the efforts of the reenactors uh, served a, a philanthropic role uh, as this movie was being made. Uh, to my understanding, uh, Ted Turner offered to make a charitable donation toward Civil War battlefield preservation and recognition of these reenactors. I believe the reenactors themselves contributed to the cause as well. And as a result, a half a million dollars was raised to save uh, Civil War battlefield sites. So you can say all you want to about this movie. We can hate on it a good bit. Uh, but that's at least one good legacy that comes out of the movie. That turns out to be a really good segue to talking a little bit more about the terrain of the wilderness itself. I encourage you to take a look at another video that we've done here on Real History, analyzing a battle that took place on this same ground almost exactly a year later, the Battle of the Wilderness, as is depicted in the movie Wicked Spring. That film does, I think, a really good job in showing the landscape, the terrain, this was a thickly wooded area where you could hardly see 10 feet down your own company line. So thick was the vegetation. And that's where we get into a little bit of a problem here in some of these forthcoming scenes. One of the problems with this portion of the film is where this attack actually occurred is very thickly wooded. And I suspect the reason that the filmmakers went with this open pasture aesthetic instead is because the scope of the attack otherwise would have been lost, perhaps, on audiences. As I mentioned a moment ago, uh, you couldn't see more than perhaps <laughs> a, a few yards uh, in this uh, very uh, thickly vegetated area. Uh, what we see here in these various shots uh, closer resembles another area of the Chancellorsville battlefield known as Hazel Grove, which would subsequently witness a lot of heavy fighting in its own right. Looks like everybody in this shot is in their, their badass, the long riders pose. <laughs> Trying to recreate uh, the glory days of the old western perhaps. I do, I do like that shot, uh, all these little details, and we see uh, squibs in the 
canvas tents and bullet holes uh, in the tents. And uh, it speaks to just how much lead was flying through the air during the actual event. And there's a really great article that can be found on the website of the American Battlefield Trust, a historical preservation organization I've been a supporter of for a long time, and you should as well. And here's what this article has to say about this very desperate moment. Terrified Yankees, quote, ran some one way and some the other. In frightened attempts to hide, a North Carolinian wrote, some of them ran in the tent and wrapped themselves in blankets. Captain J.W. Williams of Greensboro, Alabama described, quote, a moving mass of Yankees. Hundreds would turn and run to us to be taken prisoner. A northern band must have been among the last to learn of the disaster. Their boisterous tooting and thumping covered the noise of the initial onslaught until a bullet shattered the bass drum. Disintegration spread inexorably eastward. A French volunteer at Hooker's headquarters spotted the 11th Corps fugitives in close-packed ranks, rushing like legions of the damned toward him. The rebel yell unmanned the foreigner, who reported that, quote, all the Confederates roar like beasts. And then I think most succinctly of all, a soldier of Alabama comments, the enemy fled like chaff before the wind. Such was the level of surprise. And up comes AP Hill's division. And uh, U.S. troops were just completely flabbergasted by all of this. And the, the thought was, where are they all coming from? Where did they come from? Uh, it, it was just a, a complete and utter shock. My God, give him the band that. General Hooker makes a very brief cameo in this film. And one of the, the great dilemmas uh, about his involvement in this battle is that he was unconscious for a portion of it. He was leaning up against one of the pillars here on the front porch of the Chancellor Mansion in the middle of the wilderness. A shell struck it and it knocked him out cold and some of the generals around him were unsure about should the chain of command pass down to the next person there was just kind of hovering over him in this moment of frenzy uh, uh, that certainly didn't help the the broader strategic situation as it was unfolding they're digging in must be federal sound carries at night they could be a ways off Another good little detail on material culture here is the fact that Stonewall Jackson is wearing a black rubber raincoat, uh, such as he was the night that he was going out and conducting this reconnaissance. And you can see that very jacket on display today at the Virginia Military Institute where Jackson was teaching when the war began. Looking over Jackson's shoulder in this same scene is uh, the character of his brother-in-law, Morrison. Uh, but in reality, uh, that man is Scott Cooper, who has gone on to receive considerable accolades as a director himself. And he's gone on to make uh, some movies that I really like, including Hostiles, Black Mass, and more recently, The Pale Blue Eye, which we have also taken a look at here on Netflix. And so uh, this movie, in many ways, uh, was his, his big entry into the world of Hollywood, and he's made some damn good movies in the years since. General, sir, we are beyond our lines. This is no place for you, sir. Yes, Morrison is right. Jackson should not be out here. And one of the problems that uh, leads to the impending disaster here is the fact that you have a lieutenant general going out to do a corporal's job. This sort of activity is way below his pay grade. He should not be out here in between the lines doing reconnaissance firsthand. It was a very poor act of judgment on his part to be doing this. And he'll pay the consequences for it. Hold your fire! 
He's the old man here. Here's the line. Pour in on the boy. There's a good little line here that we can hear in the background. It's a lie pour it into them. This is rooted in historical fact. And I'll once more refer to the book The Great Partnership by Christian Keller. Uh, here too he does a really good job of outlining exactly what happens. The fire was coming from southern muskets in this act of friendly fire of which Jackson will be the victim. A ripple of the discharges, then a ragged volley followed, moving northward and jumping the pike. Little Sorrel, Jackson's horse, bolted at the abrupt noise and galloped toward the north through the woods. Jackson barely holding on to the reins as low branches and saplings smacked his face. J.G. Morrison, whose horse had been killed, lay momentarily stunned on the ground, but quickly regained his senses and ran toward the line of the 18th North Carolina, the regiment directly in front of the party. Cease firing, he screamed at the top of his lungs. You are firing into your own men. Seeing only the moving shadows of the horsemen, the Carolinians could not be sure they were not Federal cavalry, which had just been reported in the area. An angry voice rang out from them. Who gave that order? It's a lie. Pour it into them, boys. And we see that exact dialogue being incorporated here. Keller goes on to say, Stonewall Jackson was struck three times, twice in the left arm and once in the right hand. Amazingly, Little Sorrel escaped unscathed. The general managed to stay on his horse until surviving members of the staff reached him and gently lay him on the ground against a tree. All my wounds are by my own men, he murmured in painful surprise. The firing miraculously ceased and A.P. Hill, whose cavalcade had also been grievously hit by the last volley, rushed to the chief's side. Hence we have one of these iconic inadvertent turning points of the American Civil War. Not only are Jackson's staff members and the general himself receiving friendly fire, but there is of course Union artillery within distance that is also uh, raining down iron upon them at this given moment. And uh, amidst this melee, uh, Jackson falls off his stretcher and it leads to a big question about his imminent death that is now on the horizon. And uh, some historians have speculated that when he fell off the stretcher, that one of his lungs actually may have been punctured by one of his broken ribs. Uh, is that what leads to the onset of pneumonia, which eventually claims his life? That's one of the theories that's floating out there. Breathe deeply, gentlemen. I'll give some acknowledgement here as well, because uh, this scene defies a lot of the stereotypes that we have about Civil War medicine. We often think of these primitive sawbones who are conducting surgeries without any form of anesthetic, which wasn't in reality true at all in most cases. Uh, over 95% of Civil War surgeries were done with chloroform or the like, and that's exactly what we see Stonewall Jackson receiving here at the hands of Dr. McGuire. Uh, and so, uh, it, even though the, this movie reinforces a lot of inaccurate stereotypes, it at least gets that one little thing right. In the background, we can see the Chancellor Mansion on fire, uh, and indeed this home was destroyed during the Battle of Chancellorsville. 
Uh, you can go visit the, the site where it once stood today and you can still see some of the, the foundations that mark the ground. This once grand Virginia home that is no more. He's lost his left arm. I've lost my right. Indeed, these were the sentiments of Robert E. Lee, and that quote is essentially from him verbatim. Uh, but there was much more that was lost in addition to Stonewall Jackson's arm. Uh, U.S. forces lost about 17,000 men, killed, wounded, captured, and missing. The Confederacy lost about 13,000 men along those same lines. And it's a battle that's referred to by many historians as Robert E. Lee's greatest victory, but it comes at an absolutely terrible cost, especially considering the fact that Lee loses a greater proportion of his army in fights like Chancellorsville than did his opponents. This is a war of attrition upon his ranks. He cannot resupply his ranks to the same extent that his enemy can. And that will be one of the motivating factors that will compel him to roll the dice yet again, urging him to embark on an invasion of Pennsylvania later that summer. And we all know how that turns out. Lee was a man who gambled. He took chances. Here at the Battle of Chancellorsville, he split his forces on, on more than one occasion, but never again throughout the remainder of the war would Lee attempt such a daring flanking maneuver as was conducted by Stonewall Jackson here in May of 1863, because perhaps it just cost him too dearly in the long run. Here's another good incorporation of a real life location that still stands, and that is the home in which Jackson would ultimately perish outside of Chancellorsville at Guinea Station. Uh, this structure today is operated by the National Park Service, and it is uh, rather interestingly called the Stonewall Jackson Shrine. And the very title of that, once again, uh, evokes the power of the lost cause in post-war memory as a lot of these landmarks and locations are being federally designated and as they are being preserved. And so in some ways it's a title from American antiquity. Uh, and we'll see if it continues to retain that name in years to come. It's a really interesting question. When you return, I trust you'll find him better. And when the occasion offers, tell him that I prayed for him last night. This was the end of the so-called Great Partnership, and it was something that left Robert E. Lee quite emotionally distraught. And on this point, Christian Keller notes, the loss of Lee's partner Jackson was in and of itself a strategic level blow to the Confederacy because of how it affected Lee, the nation's only successful army commander, both professionally and personally. Of all who mourned his death, none felt more acutely the loss the country and the army had sustained than General Lee. And that is what one of the army's chaplains had to say on the matter. And it leads to this very big question, one that I was often asked at Gettysburg, what if Stonewall Jackson had lived? And that is a, a hypothetical question that we can never really answer with all honesty. Let us cross over the river and rest under the shade of the tree. For as being as quiet and subdued a person as he was, Jackson had a number of good one-liners throughout his life, including the very last words that he utters, let us cross over the river and rest under the shade of the trees. But there are a lot of other interesting things that he is saying in these final moments, in this uh, painkiller-induced delirium uh, that he's uh, experiencing here at his very end. Uh, and one of the interesting things is that he summons General A.P. Hill to battle as he's uh, yelling out these, these dreamlike orders 
to his commanders. Uh, and it was just a few years later when Robert E. Lee passes away that he likewise calls upon General A.P. Hill while he is on his deathbed. Uh, and so it's a very interesting thing considering the fact uh, that uh, both of these generals had their, their own problems and their own dilemmas with Hill in one form or another, yet some of their final thoughts were of him. And so it's an interesting psychological point as we ponder it. As I mentioned in our first episode, Analyzing Gods and Generals, uh, this is filmed at the real-life location of the Virginia Military Institute. Uh, and in some ways, this place bookends the story. It's where Jackson begins his wartime odyssey, and it's also here at VMI where it ends. And as a result, in a very long, <laughs> interminable interim, the story comes full circle. My, 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 what else is there left to say about Gods and Generals? It is a movie that was panned by most critics and uh, proportionately, I think, a similar number of historians as well. And ultimately, I think one could make the argument that it's just a wasted story. It was a, a lost opportunity. I think in the same way that the movie The Patriot was, in some regards. This was a movie that had a $60 million budget. It could have achieved great things had it remained true to its source material, the novel of the same name by Jeff Shera. But ultimately, because it has so many storylines, it has so many subplots, it tries to achieve so much it cannot detach itself from this misplaced, lost cause nostalgia that it just ends up to be this meandering cinematic mess uh, that can't decide what it wants to be and is full of all of these historical acronisms, despite the fact that it does really a good job on a lot of other aspects, including material, culture, location, the general chronology of the story, but there's just simply too much. This is a movie that had delusions of grandeur, and ultimately those delusions unhinged the storyline and it became unsalvageable as a result. Uh, and so this was a movie that in my youth, as I heard about it, as there was word of it coming out, it was one that I was really looking forward to. I was and still am a big fan of this movie's sequel, Gettysburg. Uh, but uh, this movie, despite the fact that it had a bigger budget and equal star power, it doesn't hold a flame to its <laughs> predecessor. Ah, oh, my, my, my. But as we always do here on Real History, some reading recommendations before we head out. As I've mentioned in every episode, and as I just mentioned, you gotta read the novel. You gotta read the source material. Oh, had they stayed true. My, my, my. As I also mentioned, we have The Great Partnership by Christian Keller. This looks at the very fascinating dynamic of Robert E. Lee and Thomas Jonathan Jackson's uh, military collaboration and how it succeeded in a variety of ways. And then of course too, we have A Glorious Army, Robert E. Lee's Triumph by Jeffrey Wirt, one of my good friends in the Civil War community. This uh, is a very good look and examination of Robert E. Lee rising to command during the Peninsula Campaign in 1862 and up to the eve of the Gettysburg Campaign. This too is also a very good depiction of the Army of Northern Virginia. Thank you so much for tuning in to these three episodes of Real History as we have been examining gods and generals. I realize that there are fans of this movie out there, and I realize that you may be watching it, and if you have differing opinions, that's okay. 
We want to hear about them. Just keep it respectful in the comments section below. We likewise invite you to check out our website at realhistoryfilms.com for all sorts of great resources and content. We invite you to check out our Teespring store where you can get some nice real history swag. And if you really appreciate what we do on this channel, we invite you to support us on Patreon. Thank you again for tuning in. We hope to see you next time on Real History. And until then, stay curious. Thank you.